Right now we have evictions in this country starting to skyrocket because so many people are broke, so many people cannot pay the rent, and for a long time we had eviction moratoriums in place so that way nobody could be evicted and now things are starting to return to normal. When you take a look at just a snapshot of what's going on here it gives you a real scale of the situation and the crazy thing is this is only just one piece of the puzzle and here's what I mean. According to the latest data from Eviction Lab as you can see from this screenshot here over the past 12 months there have been over 1 million almost 1.1 million evictions filed just in the last year in the United States and there have actually been about 83,000 tenants evicted. Okay, and if you think that sounds like a lot, it actually isn't. And you know why? Because Eviction Lab only tracks 10 different states and 34 different cities. Last time I checked, we have 50 states here, guys. So this could just be, you know, one fifth of what the actual eviction numbers are because they're only tracking one fifth of the states out there. So we don't even know what the real numbers are. But we've already seen 83,000 people kicked out on the streets for sure just in the past year. And it's probably more likely, you know, three, four, five times that number. And if you look at this chart here, it kind of shows you right at the beginning of January of 2020 where evictions were. It was actually kind of close to where it is today. And then it dropped off a cliff during the pandemic and then started easing its way back up as we can see here. But Eviction Lab also breaks down based on location where the most evictions are taking place right now. And as you can see at the top of this list, we have Virginia, New York, New York. You gotta make way for all the illegals in there, right? <laughs> Pennsylvania, Phoenix, Arizona, Houston, Texas, Indiana, Las Vegas, Nevada, Fort Worth, Texas, Dallas, Texas, lots of Texas cities on here. But what I would be really paying attention to if I was somebody looking to buy a home or rent someplace, I'd be looking at this list to see, first of all, is your city on this list? And how far above normal are the evictions compared to pre-pandemic? Because you might look at that overall average chart and say, well, Michael, evictions are just going back to the normal levels. And on the surface, that might be true, but there are pockets of the country where it's actually going way beyond pre-pandemic levels, like we can see from this chart here. Phoenix, Arizona is 42% above pre-pandemic eviction levels. Houston, Texas, 45% above pre-pandemic levels. Las Vegas is a whopping 54% above pre-pandemic levels. Minnesota is 35% above pre-pandemic levels. Columbus, Ohio, is 35% above. Minneapolis, Minnesota is 55% above. First of all, I gotta say, it does make you wonder when you see sanctuary cities on this list like uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, that has these really high eviction filings far above pre-pandemic levels. It's gotta make you wonder, you know, why are we kicking out people that actually are citizens of this country from their homes for not paying the rent while simultaneously giving somebody that doesn't even belong here a free place to live. So that's pretty wild, but that's not the point. The point here is that there's a lot of people currently being kicked out of their homes at probably one of the worst times ever. Obviously it's never really a good time to be kicked out of your home, but the unique problem is right now is these people who are being evicted are probably not participating in the good part of the economy, meaning they probably don't have a stock portfolio that's booming. They probably don't have rental properties that are paying them and appreciating in value. They probably don't have gold and silver, you know, to hedge against inflation. They don't have any of this stuff. So to me, the question becomes for somebody like this, what do they do, guys? Is it just add to the homeless population? Do they get back on their feet? It's interesting because you hear about these eviction numbers but you don't really hear what happens to these people afterwards. You know, how many of them actually get back on their feet or move in with family or end up homeless? You know, we just don't know. And no doubt some of these people deserve to be evicted because they're playing the system. They intentionally didn't pay rent for a few years while they could get away with it during the moratoriums. And other people are just unfortunate and fall on hard times and are just not able to pay. You know, there's a big difference between people who are gaming the system on purpose and cheating landlords out of money 
versus people that just fell on hard times and lost a job or have a medical emergency or something like that. But even if you're not falling on hard times and things are going well in life, you can still end up evicted. And um, what I mean by that is not like you're getting an eviction notice, but you can just be kicked out of your rental, guys. This is one of the main things that actually encouraged me to buy instead of rent, besides the price differential being more favorable towards buying at the time of purchase, is that I was tired of always having the threat to move because where I was living, uh, the property manager there was a horrible person. Let me just put it that way, okay? Every single year, she would threaten, we're not gonna be able to renew the lease. She was basically extorting me and my wife to pay her a commission in order to stay in the unit and have to pay more rent on top of that. Otherwise, she would tell the landlord not to renew our lease, okay? And the only reason we decided to pay her, by the way, is because our rent was so cheap. We were paying so far below market value that it still made sense to give her a little money as like a commission to rent us the unit again rather than to move into a more expensive unit. It would have actually cost more for the second option. But anyhow, one of my viewers, Christian, he lives over in uh, Southern California, over in Irvine, very expensive area of Orange County. And um, he says that he's been living in this unit for five years and they really love it. They love the area. There's clean, no homeless, you know, lots of young families nearby, and it's safe, which is obviously very important in California or anywhere really, but especially there. He says also that the unit that he's been renting has been under market value. Started off renting at $2,500 a month five years ago, and now he's up to $2,900 a month, which isn't too bad for California standards and how much the cost of living and inflation has pushed prices on everything up. Like, I've seen a lot of people here in Miami have their rentals double, you know, in just one year. So having it go up 400 bucks over a five year period isn't that bad at all. Similar to me, Christian also had his problems with the property manager there. He said that they're very dishonest and anytime that he made a repair request that there was always some friction from the landlord. Apparently the landlord uh, lives out of the country or it's not nearby. Every time they would send somebody over to make repairs, it would just be shoddy workmanship, you know, just like basically slapping a band-aid on it, you know, not a good repair at all. And he said that the interaction with this property has been purely transactional. There's no human element. You know, the property manager could care less if they're there or not. And same goes for the owner, you know? So it's just give me your money, give me your money. But here's what happened to Christian. He recently made a repair request for a water leak under the kitchen sink, which turned out to be a clogged food dispenser drain line, okay? But the repair person came over and accidentally replaced the food dispenser and didn't actually fix the clogged line. And the landlord said that, hey, I shouldn't have to pay for this and wanted him to cover the cost of this repair. So I said after a bunch of back and forth, he gets a letter in the mail a few weeks later stating that the landlord wants to terminate the lease due to selling the property. So now it's game over because of a repair that was mistakenly made due to no fault of his own. So this can happen to anybody. You can end up being essentially evicted from your place even if you're a good tenant, even if you're paying the rent on time, if everything seems to be going well, just because of people like this. So now the problem is he has to move out by the end of the year, at least he has some time. It's not like a 60 day notice or anything like that, but all similar rentals in the area are anywhere between $3,500 and $4,000 a month. So this is a terrible position to be in. It's really the biggest downside to renting, guys. In my opinion, it always has been. I think renting is great right now due to how cheap it is compared to buying, but it does come with its downsides. And to me, this is probably the biggest one, is just not knowing how long you're gonna be able to live somewhere. Now, some people like to move a lot. When I was doing a lot of rentals in the real estate market, um, I had tenants and clients that would specifically move every year or every two years just to try out a new neighborhood, just to shake up the place and live somewhere different, a different building, and they liked moving, you know? But for me, I'm completely the opposite. Once I find some place I like, I wanna just settle and stay there for as long as I can. And for somebody like me, having the constant threat of having to leave 
was a no-go for me. But I don't think that one thing alone right now is enough to justify buying, and I wanna make that clear because some people might hear this story and say, well, there's, there you go, that's the reason why you buy instead of rent, okay? Well, not necessarily, guys, especially if you're looking at paying 50% to 100% more per month for your mortgage because with that big of a price gap, it's still worth the uncertainty of not knowing if you're gonna be able to renew each year if you ask me, and it's gonna be cheaper. Yeah, it's expensive to move, but it's still gonna be cheaper with that big of a price gap. But like I said in past videos, to make that work and have it be a smart financial move, you need to be saving the difference that you would be spending if you bought something and paying a mortgage and investing that difference. Because if you're not, then it might not be worth being a renter. So it might still make more sense for somebody like that to become a homeowner because you're having those forced savings you're being forced to build equity in the property whether you want to or not now one thing I like to bring up here and there on the channel is the EV car market and before you get all crazy the reason I like to bring this up and talk about it is because it's not that I'm really against EV cars it's more that I'm against a forced transition into owning one that's that's what the part of it I'm against okay I don't care if people drive an EV car or they love their EV car that's great, just don't force me to drive one is kind of how I feel about it. Just like men who like to walk around in a dress, that's great, good for you, don't make me do it, okay? It's just the same kind of thing. It's your personal preference, live your life how you choose, but don't force me to do something. One of the biggest barriers for people to drive EV cars has always been the price because they've been more expensive than regular cars. But the prices on EV cars are coming down so fast right now that they're starting to close the gap and get much closer to what a gas-powered car would cost. In fact, uh, two years ago, you would have paid about $17,000 more for an EV car versus a gas-powered car, but the gap today is only about $5,000 more. So the gap is closing very quickly. And of course, we can all thank Tesla for this because Tesla has been the number one EV company that has been bringing prices down like no tomorrow and it's been forcing other EV makers into big financial trouble right now. If you take a look at this chart right here, the yellow line is Tesla cars, the green line are all EVs, and the bottom one in blue are all brand new cars. And you can see the price of these EV cars kind of spiked in the middle of 2022, just like everything else did in price. And then dramatically started coming down. Like literally the price of these cars has been crashing ever since January of 2023. And despite what a lot of people want to believe, guys, like the reason that these prices are coming down as much as they are, are number one, because Tesla's been cutting prices, but also because they're not selling. I understand that Tesla, you know, has the best selling car in America, but that's only one model. That's only one car. That does not account for the rest of the EVs and all the rest of the EV market. So as a whole, people are still not adopting it at the level that the government wants to see. Wow, everything about this listing is extreme. First of all, the price tag is $3 million, and they're advertising it for sale as if it's just an empty lot. Just overlook the fact there's an old deteriorating house here that's not part of the deal. You're going to get that as is. It's part of the sale. But yeah, we're not counting that. We're just selling this for the land value. Haven't lowered the price at all since September of 2023. And obviously no takers, shocker here. But here's even more of a shocking part of this listing. For the longest time, the owner did not have a homestead exemption on the property. And you see their property tax bill was $24,000, $23,000 a year. And then when they put a homestead on it in 2022, bam, Property taxes went down to $6,500 a year. I've never seen such an extreme case where the property taxes go down by that much by putting the property in a homestead. And according to Cox Automotive, they say we're gonna continue seeing prices come down as more dealers just continue to slash prices on these things to get them sold because they have so much inventory. And if you want to buy a brand new EV right now, take a look at this chart, guys. This shows you which EV models are coming down the most in price right now. The number one is the Ford F-150 Lightning with a 21% price cut from February 2023 to February 2024. Tesla Model Y has a 16% cut in the same time frame. BMW has a cut. Tesla Model 3, 
Ford Mustang Mach-E, another BMW model, the Chevy Bolt, all are cheaper today than they were a year ago. So we actually do have some deflation in the car market right now, but only if you're looking to buy a brand new electric car. Now, according to the US Department of Energy, they say that the batteries for these electric cars are now 90% cheaper than they were back in 2008. So that is a substantial drop in price. And part of the reason you're seeing the cost of the cars come down as well is because the cost of production is coming down. And they say that the battery can make up as much as 40% of the cost to make the vehicle. So roughly half. So right now they're predicting that the, the cost to make an electric car is gonna be the same as making a gas powered car by the time 2027 rolls around. And one thing I, I question and I wanna know from you guys is if that happens, like say EV cars even become cheaper than gas powered cars by then. Are you gonna buy one? That's what I wanna know. Are you gonna buy one just because it's the cheaper car and not care about the problems with the range or having to charge the car, which obviously takes a lot longer than filling up the gas tank, things like that. Let me know if stuff like that matters to you or not, or all you care about is the price. And I realize a lot of people don't even buy brand new cars, okay? If a brand new EV is cheaper than a gas powered car, then most certainly a used electric car is gonna be cheaper than a gas powered one as well. Now, one of my viewers, Lynn, she sent me this story out of Boston because they have such a problem with commercial real estate that the mayor of Boston is looking to raise taxes on commercial real estate in the city in response to the declining property values of several downtown office buildings, which could impact the city's budget and potentially residential property owners. And if this measure is approved in the city of Boston, it will give the, the mayor the power to raise taxes on commercial real estate in the city for the next five years. And they say that Boston is actually highly reliant on property taxes to pay for its city services. And much of the property tax revenue comes from commercial buildings, not homeowners. Here's the problem, guys. The value of the commercial property is falling so much and so fast over there right now that they're estimated to lose about $1.5 billion in tax revenue over the next five years because of how far the, the values of these buildings have declined. Isn't that insane? They say that the reason they're doing this is to protect residents, help kind of smooth in this new reality that we may be facing as a city. So yeah, it might save you as the homeowner from paying more in property taxes because they're gonna raise it on commercial, but guess what that does? Increases inflation. Why? Let me explain. Because the businesses that are renting out these commercial office buildings or whatever businesses are in these buildings that are having their taxes raised, the expenses for those businesses are gonna skyrocket due to a higher property tax. And what happens when a business has increased costs? They pass it on to the customer. That's what they always do and they always will do. So everybody who wants to go get a donut in downtown Boston or just go for a coffee is now gonna be paying more because the business that is there is paying more, which could cause more layoffs. It can cause more businesses to go out of business because they just can't hack it anymore. They're, they're seeing a decline in revenue and people coming in because the prices have to go up. It's a disaster, guys. And that's why I keep telling people that this whole disaster with commercial real estate is gonna have tremendous impacts on our economy that we haven't even seen yet. It's only the beginning right now of this commercial real estate crash. But once you start seeing more of the owners of these buildings default and hand the keys back to the bank, and you start seeing more bank failures, and then measures like this happen where they're gonna be raising property taxes on the existing buildings that haven't given their building back and destroying the businesses within, it's gonna cause some major problems with business and with our economy. And we just haven't really seen the full impacts of it yet, not even close. So everybody who says, oh, well, I don't worry about the commercial real estate crash because you know residential real estate's still doing just fine. Well, it won't be doing just fine when all these people you know, are losing their jobs and losing their businesses because the city is hiking up taxes and they can no longer afford to hack it. So just understand how connected everything is and how this is all gonna have a domino effect eventually and is going to lead to this recession. So if you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you subscribe to the channel. And if you don't wanna wait for my next video to come out, check out this one on the screen right over here and I'll see you in the next one.